One of the highlights of the Chem Connection bulletins is the update from the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki. There's always a lot happening in Helsinki, so let's connect with Wim de Koen, who will provide the latest news of today and tomorrow. And since Wim is leading the Hazard Assessment and Scientific Coordination Group, I'm pleased to say that Wim will also talk about the urgent research needs to further push the boundaries of chemical safety assessment and the needs to bridge science and chemicals regulations. Hi Wim, glad to have you with us today. Hello Chert, uh, looking forward to share updates on the following key topics with you and the ChemCon network. Uh, first of all, we have the CSS Indicators Framework, developed by ECHA and the European Environmental Agency. Uh, second, we have ECACHEM, our new system to make data on chemicals available. And third, as you mentioned earlier, ECHA's publication on the regulatory research needs, where we try to push boundaries of chemical safety assessments further and to bridge science to chemicals regulation. Let's start with the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability's Indicator Framework. What is the background of this new activity? Uh, well, as part of the European Commission's Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, uh, we are tasked together with the European Environment Agency, the EEA, and the European Commission to build a framework of indicators to measure how the EU chemicals policy is impacting the exposure of humans and environment to hazardous chemicals. How will you measure whether the EU's chemicals policy is delivering? Can you give some examples? Well, um, the indicators will cover topics such as chemical production volumes, emissions, identification and classification of substances of various levels of concern, the presence in the environment, and also aspects linked to waste, decontamination and remediation. We will also look, for example, at the exposure information generated through human biomonitoring uh, across the EU and the overall dynamics of the EU industrial chemical markets, especially of hazardous chemicals. Interesting. What are the current status and expectations for the indicator framework and what is ECHA's role? Together with the EEA, we have identified the indicators and we will provide data for these indicators. Our role is to collect the data, refine it to our knowledge and offer it for the policymakers to decide how to protect EU citizens and the environment. The work to build the indicators framework is getting ready and we will push, publish it uh, around mid-April together with the EEA. After the publication, the data will continue to be generated and it will be used to assess how the EU chemicals policy is delivering in real life. So, more data generation. As always, while operating chemical regulations and tasks, ECHA gathers and generates a lot of data on chemicals. Early 2024, you launched ECACHEM, the new public chemicals database. Can you tell us more about this? Uh, yes, we host one of the world's widest databases on chemicals and we make the data that we collect under legislations that we implement available for anyone to consult on our website. By the end of last January, we published a new system to make this data available. It's called ECACHEM. Here, we already publish information from the more than 100,000 REACH registrations. In the next phase, after summer, we will launch the revised classification and labeling inventory of chemicals on ECACHEM, with information also on how authorities and companies classify substances on the EU market in a more user-friendly form. Later this year, we'll start moving also information on the regulatory activities that the European authorities are doing in relation to the chemicals. So, and also the obligations arising from these when it comes to marketing and using substances in the EU, for example, as a result of restrictions. Great to have all this information in one place. What's new compared to the old database? Um, as said, um, ECHA makes industry-submitted data available as well as information generated in the EU regulatory processes. So ECHA-CHEM is the new solution to share this growing amount of information that we host. ECHA's current information on chemicals platform, launched in 2016, has grown rapidly and it contains information on over 360,000 chemicals. ECACHEM allows us to better handle this growing diversity and quantity of data, also while taking advantage of the latest technological advancements. So, 
While building the system in a more stable and also flexible way, we're also paying attention to the user experience. And over the past years, we've been consulting our users um, on our services to get their views on features like navigation and ways to make information available. So we're also preparing through this way uh, ourselves to accommodate the needs that will be arising from new tasks that will be assigned to ECHA later. How does ECHAChem relate to the Open Data Platform on Chemicals Initiative? Well, the ECHAChem is built on the principles of modularity and expandability. In other words, it's made up of building blocks that can be gradually added to the system as long as they're designed in a particular way. Think of them as Lego blocks. Um, this is what enables us to adapt and expand ECHAChem when we get into new tasks. And in the same way, this makes it possible for ECHAChem to form the foundation for the new EU Common Data Platform on Chemicals. This EU Common Data Platform has been foreseen by the European Commission and has been allocated to ECHA by a recent legislative proposal. The EU Common Data Platform would not only contain information uh, on the chemical regulations that, that are under ECHA's mandate, but also from that of other EU agencies that deal with different pieces of chemicals regulation in the EU. While collecting the data on chemicals, have you spotted any areas where the information doesn't exist or is not sufficient to ensure their safe use? In, indeed, um, we have identified many areas where further scientific research is needed to generate data or new technologies to help regulators making better hazard and risk assessment. And recently we published a report on these research needs supporting our regulatory challenges. And we use opportunities such as ChemCon conferences to talk about these topics. We want to actually bridge the gap between science and regulation in collaboration with our partners in a transition towards safer chemicals. The overall aim is to reduce risks posed by hazardous chemicals to health and the environment and to reduce the need for animal testing and to create a next generation risk assessment for chemicals. Okay. What are the identified regulatory challenges and what is the new way forward to accelerate regulatory acceptance of alternatives for animal testing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, identified regulatory challenges can be summarized in, in three points. First and for all, we uh, focus on better protection against harmful chemicals. We emphasize specific concerns around neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity and endocrine disruption. These challenges arise from our limited identification capabilities, the scarce test methods and a lack of understanding of the underlying toxicity mechanism. Secondly, we need to address chemical pollution in the environment, since this contributes to the ecosystem's degradation and biodiversity loss. Our report highlights the need for improved assessment methods that consider bioaccumulation, fate of chemicals in the environment, along with the toxicity assessment to a broader range of organisms. Third, there's the shifting away from animal testing. And this is part of our core mandate. And we want to minimize and ideally move away from animal testing where possible. And this publication outlines the importance of developing new approach methodologies, so-called NAMs, to substitute or reduce current in vivo test methods, ensuring the protection of nature and human health without compromising on safety standards. So as a new way forward, you can actually say that this first and foremost starts with the, our first time publication of our evolving research and development agenda. These so-called uh, key areas of regulatory challenge are formulated as an evolving agenda aiming to support and inspire the research community. We intend to update and refine these scientific areas as they evolve and new challenges emerge. Um, a definite highlight in this research agenda is development and validation of NAMS, obviously, uh, especially in areas such as neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity and endocrine disruption. Also, we, see, we want to see a better incorporation overall of mechanistic data to enhance scientific certainty. And last but not least, we call for further improving chemical data availability, especially for substances uh, such as polymers, 
and micro and nano size materials. Because developing knowledge and methodologies to support the hazard and risk assessment of these substances is urgently needed. Let's take a deep dive in terms of the protection of citizens to most harmful chemicals. Which areas deserve urgently more attention? Overall, there are three areas that deserve urgent attention. First, there's the area of neurotoxicity. There's a critical need for attention on chemicals that may impair neurological systems. The limited availability of high quality data from animal studies on developmental and adult neurotoxicity underlines the urgent need for developing new approach methods to assess these hazards more effectively. Secondly, there's the area of immunotoxicity and the rise in immune system related diseases such as allergies and autoimmune disorders calls for a focus on identifying and managing the chemicals that can harm the immune system development, especially during sensitive windows of exposure. And the third area is the area of endocrine disruption. With these new hazard classes introduced under the CLP regulation, uh, both for human health and the environment, there's an urgent need to enhance NAM uh, approaches to better understand and manage the risks posed by endocrine disrupting chemicals. Why specifically neurotoxicity and immunotoxicity? Well, indeed, on neurotoxicity, we know that there's a critical developmental impact. Neurotoxic chemicals can have a profound impact on developing neurological systems, potentially leading to long lasting neurological disorders. For example, the brain's development from prenatal stages through adolescence is highly sensitive to toxic insults, making neurotoxicity a significant concern for public health. Also, we face limited data availability for the moment. Uh, there's a scarcity of high quality data on neurotoxic effects of chemicals, especially regarding developmental neurotoxicity and adult neurotoxicity. Such a data gap ham hampers the ability to fully assess risks and implement risk management measures. So um, we identify the need for specific meta development. The complexity of the nervous system and the subtle effects of neurotoxicants urge the development and validation of new approach methods. We believe that these methods could provide more precise, faster and ethically preferable alternatives to the traditional animal testing and enhance our abilities to identify and mitigate neurotoxic risks. Also in the area of immune system, we note a rise of disease rates. The increase of immune related diseases such as allergies, autoimmune diseases demonstrate the importance of understanding how chemicals may contribute to immunotoxicity. Identifying chemicals that harm the immune system uh, development or function is crucial for preventing these conditions. And there's also here a critical window of exposure. The immune system develops in stages, each with its own vulnerabilities to toxicants. And identifying these critical windows and understanding how chemicals interact with these developing immune systems can help in developing strategies to minimize exposure during such sensitive periods. And also here there's again the need for advanced testing methods. The traditional testing methods may not adequately capture the complex interactions within the immune system or the subtle ways that chemicals can induce immunotoxic effects. There's a really pressing need for advanced testing strategies that can more accurately predict immunotoxic risks, again leading to better protection for human health. The area of endocrine disruptors is still a hot topic, not only because of the new hazard classes under the COP regulation, but also because of specific research needs where you call for action. What exactly does ECHA believe is needed in this area and does it go beyond EATS? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, in the area of endocrine disruptors, and disruptors, ECHA is advocating for a more comprehensive approach that goes beyond the traditional EATS, so the estrogen, androgen, thyroid and steroidogenic modalities. We call for expanding both research and testing in order to push for developing innovative assays that can actually cover the broad spectrum of endocrine pathways, including both EATS and non-EATS mechanisms. An example of a non-EATS mechanism um, is, for example, the retinoid system disruption. Uh, it's a critical pathway where chemicals can interfere with retinoid functions, impacting cell growth, vision and development. 
And disruptions here can lead, for example, to developmental abnormalities and reproductive issues across a wide range of species. And it highlights the importance of addressing such mechanisms in our regulatory frameworks. So we should also incorporate more uh, species in our test system. On top of that, there is an emphasis on including a wider array of organisms in testing protocols, particularly for invertebrates, so we can better understand also the ecological impact of endocrine disruptors. Thank you. Endocrine disruptors have a huge impact on the aquatic environment. In terms of addressing chemical pollution in the overall environment, ECHA draws the attention on the effects on biodiversity. Can you tell us a bit more what's needed here? Indeed. Um, we're putting a spotlight on the delicate interplay between endocrine disruption and, for example, biodiversity, uh, because we emphasize the urgent need also here for a holistic approach to tackle chemical pollution in the environment. So, so here's what we believe is needed. We need, first and foremost, a broader species assessment. It means the current testing is predominantly focused on a limited set of species in test batteries, and we advocate for the inclusion of a more diverse range of organisms, particularly those for critical ecosystems, functionality and biodiversity. We also believe that here NAMS can provide breakthroughs. There's a call for the adoption of NAMS that can better predict the effects of chemicals across different species. This includes in vitro and silico and omics technologies that can offer a deeper insight into the mechanism of toxicity and the ecological consequences. We should also increase our ecosystem level understanding. This means understanding the cascading effect of, for example, endocrine disruptors on the ecosystem. Um, this requires an expansion of research to study not only the effects on individual species, but also assess the interactions within communities and impacts on ecosystem structure and functioning. In brief, ECHA's call to action revolves around enhancing our scientific toolkit, so to speak, and the regulatory strategies to safeguard biodiversity against the threat of pollution, including endocrine disruptors, for example, ensuring the health and resilience of our planetary ecosystems. Neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity and ED require animal testing, which is considered a last resort. Therefore, in the area of NAMS, ECHA is pushing a lot of activities. The Commission is working on a roadmap and also in terms of research needs, ECHA has now formulated what precisely is needed. What short-term needs did you identify and what could be the supporting role of Read Across? Indeed, there are a couple of short-term needs under the NAM area. Uh, first, there is the need to accelerate the development and validation of NAMS to provide reliable alternatives to the traditional animal testing for assessing neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity and endocrine disruption. Uh, we need benchmarking and standardization. Um, that is, establishing benchmark substances and standard protocols for NAMS to ensure their reliability, reproducibility and facilitate a broader regulatory acceptance in the assessments. And let's not forget training and capa capacity building. Um, we need to enhance expertise and infrastructure across regulatory bodies and research institutions to effectively implement NAMS in chemical safety evaluations. Indeed, you refer to Read Across, and in relation to Read Across, we believe that there is indeed an, uh, an overall supporting role for NAMS. Utilizing Read Across with the incorporation of mechanistic data from NAMS, we believe will provide us with a deeper understanding of the chemical toxicity pathways, and it could point to similarity in mechanisms of action, for example, and help us build stronger hypotheses when creating Read Across uh, assessments. So we, we really stress the importance of regulatory acceptance of these NAMs as promoting the acceptance of read across supported by NAMS data in regulatory submissions will be critical to streamline the safety assessments overall, while keeping adherence to the highest scientific standards. So in essence, through a strategic push towards NAMS, complemented by 
innovative use under Reedy Cross, for example, we believe we could mark a significant leap towards more ethical, efficient and scientifically robust chemical safety assessments. And we paved the way for a future where animal testing is no longer the norm. Last but not least, you are also making a claim for more data to be generated on polymers and nanomaterials. What exactly are the urgent focal points of attention here? Yes. Um, indeed, in addressing the challenges related to polymers and nanomaterials, ECHA is drawing the attention to the need for, let's say, a comprehensive data generation initiative with a focus on two key areas. First, in the area of polymers, we believe there is a pressing need for more detailed information on the environmental and health hazard posed by these polymers, considering their diverse structures and fate and behaviors. This includes um, understanding of their potential for persistence, by accumulation and toxicity, or the PBT overall. And in terms of their environmental fate, we really need to enhance our understanding of how polymers degrade and persist in the environment. This is crucial, given the growing concern around microplastics and their impact on ecosystems and human health. Um, in relation to methodological development, we urge for the development of tailored methodologies for assessing polymers, giving their unique properties and behaviors. This is we believe crucial for an accurate safety evaluation and regulatory decision making. Uh, secondly, in the area of nanomaterials, there is first of all still a need to better characterize nanomaterials. We need really to advance techniques for characterizing these nanomaterials, including their size, shape, surface properties and functionalization. This is vital for the understanding their interactions with biological systems and the environment. Um, on their exposure and toxicity aspect, also here we believe there's a, a critical need for data on um, exposure pathways and po potential toxicological effects of nanomaterials, considering their unique abilities to interact at the cellular and molecular uh, levels. And we also here urge that the regulatory frameworks remain flexible to better accommodate the unique challenges posed by nanomaterials ensuring that their safety assessments are comprehensive and reflect the current state of scientific knowledge. So, to summarize, ECHA's call for action really underscores the urgency of developing a robust and specific data generation uh, approach for polymers and nanomaterials, because we want to address their unique challenges and ensure the safe use and the management within our ecosystems and societies. Thank you for your time and sharing this information. Looking forward to seeing WIMS ECHA colleagues in June at ChemCon Asia 2024 in Bangkok.